Beautiful. It's always nice to start with bells in the morning. Um, so welcome to Lewiston First. And those of you who are joining us online, welcome as well. Uh, my name is Kayla Sabeel. I'll be standing in for Cody um, part of the time to just cover for his time. He's off officiating a wedding at a friend's with a friend. Um, I'd also like to introduce you to Luna. This is her first time being a uh, pastor's dog. So that was her first time hearing bells and her first time hearing the organ. So if you see her looking a little bit overwhelmed, it's just because it's all so beautiful and she can't take it all in. Um, and we'll go ahead and start um, our service with our gathering words. Please stand for our gathering words. What mysteries there are in God's world. We, so sophisticated, stand in awe at the wonders of the natural world. We look at the tiniest seeds and wonder what will happen. From that small seed will grow a large shrub. Although we consider our gifts to be small and insignificant, God will use our gifts in miraculous ways. Praise the God of small seeds and mighty power. Amen. Please remain standing for the All right, so we come in the time of service where we share our joys and concerns. If you're here joining us in person, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone around uh, for you to share. If you're online, if you would like to put it in the comments, we may not see them right away, but know that we'll be holding them in prayer as well. Um, and after I'm done carrying around and we're done praying as a group, 
uh, David Moen, who is also helping lead today's service, will lead us in prayer. So let us be in prayer. I'm Pat Heimgartner. Um, I talked with uh, Tiffany Roth this morning, Irene's daughter-in-law, and she's losing ground steadily, so it probably won't be long. Hi, um, my name's David, and I um, have a joy to share, and that is that yesterday, uh, for my work, I was working up in Kamii and in a remote area, and my dog decided that he wanted to go on a forest run, and uh, he disappeared. And so when the event was over, I was packed up, and I couldn't find him. I got really worried. And I drove around for nearly two hours looking for him and leaving messages any, at nearby farm homes, <laughs> quote unquote nearby. And uh, anyway, it turned out that one of the ranchers found him running down the middle of the highway up there. <laughs> uh, and I got him back. So I'm really happy about that. It was a real joy to, to have him back. And um, the prayer concern I have is just I want to pray for my friends, um, several, I have several friends that would really benefit from being a part of this church, and I want to pray for them. Here first, or nobody else did. Um, and then we have, um, I'd like to lift up, oh, here, I'll, um, well, I'd like to lift up a family in Clarkston, oh, a few families in Clarkston. There was an accident, um, down, uh, I believe in Nevada. Um, I'm not good with details, so I apologize for that to start. But three um, freshmen at Grand Canyon University passed away this week, two of which were from our community, um, and one of which is from Hawaii. But let's keep all of the families in our prayers. Absolutely. Um, still ongoing situation with my children and it's getting a little volatile and somewhat politicking and so I just pray that God works in the justice system as well as our entire system to generationally build what's best for families and safety for my children please and thank you then we'll also lift up all of the prayers um, listed in the bulletin and we'll go into uh liturgical prayer. Uh, join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we bless you and thank you for this day you've called to set apart for us to be together and to receive your word. Thank you that you delight in hearing our concerns and our prayers, and it strengthens our hearts and encourages us to share them. So we lift them up to you with gratitude, knowing that you are faithful and that you hear us and that you are working on our behalf and concerns for love in our lives. We pray for all the concerns that were brought up today. We pray that your spirit would be present to each of the needs that were mentioned and comforting and protective. And also when I ask you, Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit and fill our hearts with your gifts. Let our love be true and our charity be generous. Help us in all of our needs and grant us knowledge to do what is right. Advise us in our doubts, strengthen us in our weaknesses. Protect us when we're tempted and console us when we're afraid, O oh, gracious one. Holy Spirit, pour your light into our hearts, in our minds and souls. 
Align us, Lord, and help us to live holy lives, to grow in goodness and grace. Amen. Thank you. Now we'll join together as a group to uh, say a version of the Lord's Prayer. God, lover of us all, most holy one, Help us to respond to you, to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offenses, just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good. For we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole again. Amen.
That was beautiful. Thank you. Our scripture reading is from Luke 18, and it is the story of the tax man and the Pharisee. He told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, O oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man. I fast twice a week and tithe on all of my income. Meanwhile, the tax man slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up and said, God, give mercy, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went home, made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. Thank you. Gotta say that's probably one of uh, the fall on your face is probably one of my favorite parts of scripture. Um, just so visual, just visual. Um, so this week, uh, David Moen and I will be talking with you. I'm going to start us off with a look at the scripture, a little deep dive, and a couple of my own stories, and then David will take over. But just give me, you want to? She's practicing. Um, so the scripture today is a parable from Jesus. There are two characters. One is a Pharisee and one is a tax collector. Both are at the temple to pray. This is a public place of prayer, just like where we are now. Also, like right now, there were likely other worshipers there to pray. Most who came in, including the tax collector, would join the group to pray and worship. However, the Pharisee kept himself separate from the group to pray. He also sep separates himself from those in his prayer. His first words in his conversation to God are basically, thank you for making me so much better than them. This hit me, my ears a little sideways, I'll be honest, but it also got me wondering, was he right? He made a good point in that he does go above and beyond what is required by law. Christians are not required to fast, yet he speaks of it. He also tithes more than is required as well. The things that he lists seems like what we are supposed to do, right? I mean, we usually have a whole campaign about tithing. We even have cards for you to fill out this Sunday, too. They're bright and orange, so if you lose them like I keep doing, you'll be able to find them. Um, I mean, it would be weird, right, if I stood up here and told you that the man who tithed excessively was in the wrong. But let's take a look at the man's other actions that his tithing and acts of devotion were wrapped in. I think they could give us some insight. When the Pharisee arrives at prayer time, he sets himself apart from the crowd. When kids do this at the school I work in, it's usually to get attention, and I'm going to suggest that it's the same here. Then, once he has the attention of the other worshipers, he makes a point of saying how much he has done for God, and the money he has spent. The focus in his prayer is on him, how he, the Pharisee, is doing everything right. Not only does he want attention, he wants God and everyone else to know that he is better than they are. Now let's look at the tax collector. He comes in and stays far from the altar, likely blending into the crowd of other worshipers. Instead of talking to God about what the tax collector has done for God, the man immediately admitted that he was a sinner. The tax collector wasn't looking for attention. The focus of the prayer he lifted up wasn't on his tithing habits at all, but on what he really needed from God, mercy. This difference in motive was what Jesus was referring to. Jesus commended the man whose focus was on God and God's mercy 
and condemned the man whose focus was on himself and how amazing he was. Now, this whole scripture is pretty short. I mean, you've probably seen the ones that take five minutes to read. This one's pretty short. And this, this scene that it is describing is even shorter. My guess is that all of this happened over the span of five minutes in a busy day at the temple. Each man only spoke one or two sentences, yet these actions spoke volumes about why the men were doing what they were doing. These small actions made a huge difference in how Jesus saw the two men. One prayer from each showed where their priorities lay. Our small actions can make a difference too. And just like in the scripture, our motive and intentions play a big part in what we are doing. Oftentimes, it will lead us to places we never thought we would go, doing ministry we never thought we would do. Honestly, small actions can be everything. This seems to be especially true of the small humans I work with during the week. I work as a paraprofessional at Highland Elementary over in Clarkston. Small actions also mean a lot to me in this setting. There have been several times this week, as well as this year, when I have felt just a little bit overwhelmed by kindergarten recess. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, have ever had the joy of working with kindergartners. They are definitely a joy and little pinballs. Um, I work with one other person to get the kiddos from the cafeteria down to the playground. The hardest part is getting the kids to calm down enough to head down to the playground without injuring each other, as I was saying, like jumping from person to person. Um, sometimes not all of the kids are done eating. Sometimes one of our kids decides they just don't want to go to the playground. I had one kid tell me straight out that she wanted to stay where she was until she didn't want to be there anymore. <laughs> Which, stellar communication, fantastic, unrealistic expectations, but stellar communications. On those days when I was feeling too small in a crowd of four and five-year-olds, I used my radio to call the office. Even when I didn't use it correctly, I'm, I'm still learning, and they had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> Someone came out and helped. Sometimes they walk kids down to the playground, sometimes they help kids get to the bathroom, and a few times the principal came and took a kid off of my hands who I was struggling with. Each of these seemingly small acts made a huge difference. They changed the situation from utter chaos to slightly managed chaos. And my overwhelmed self into slightly less frazzled person all joking aside, their help turned the moment around. Their willingness to jump in made as much of an impact as what they did to help. Their motive and intention gave more weight to their work. I could see their care for the students and how they interacted with them, and very much appreciated the camaraderie they offered me and my coworker. A love for the kids is the main reason many of us do what we do. While I haven't asked my coworkers directly what their motivations are, it shows through in their little actions. Just like the tax collector in the temple, how he said what he said and how he did what he did communicated just as much as his actions. Honestly, as intense as kindergarten recess can be, it's a highlight of my day. It's when we get to really see the kids as they are and hear about their interests. During recess, I get to learn more names and push kids on the swings. One kid went from needing to be pushed on the swings constantly to now he's pushing the kids around, on the swings, not around, sorry. Um, there's a difference. There is so much more growth that can happen in these spaces. It reminds me why I do what I do. It makes me question it all at the same time. Since Jesus is encouraging us to consider our motives in scripture this week, I have spent some time contemplating mine. This is my fourth year in public school, so I have still a lot to learn. I have worked in three districts and have run the gamut from science tutor to recess duty and back to helping kids of all ages distracting behavior, um, manage the distracting behavior. Um, people ask me sometimes what paraprofessionals or instructional assistants are, and the best way to describe it is I'm the extra adult. So whatever needs to happen, that's what happens. It's really quite an honor. 
Through this variety of work, my motive has stayed the same. In my soul, I believe that each of us is a beloved child of God. And God made us each unique and lovely in our own way. In my work, I have the honor of showing each child how much God loves them and helping them be the person he calls them to be. That could be a math whiz or a fantastic artist. That could be something as complex as a healer. Some of them already have the knack or something as simple as a kind person. I certainly don't know, but I hope to help them figure it out. No matter what, I feel called to help the kids learn how to be kind to others and also kind to themselves. It is easy to look at others and show compassion, but sometimes it is harder to do for our own selves. How I help the kids figure this out is determined by them. Sometimes it is a quiet conversation between subjects. Sometimes it is actively reminding them that wrestling isn't allowed and that throwing rocks hurts. That was a couple times this week. Um, whatever variety I find as I continue, I'm here for it. Even something as simple as greeting kids by their name can mean a lot. It also means something when you watch them twirl around on the monkey bars or you ask them about their awesome Spider-Man backpack, which there are quite a few this year, I will say. One morning, a kid was struggling to be at school away from his family and we had a very involved conversation because I let it slip that I like Legos. We had a very involved conversation about putting dinosaur Legos into Star Wars Lego spaceships. Uh, we followed that conversation up over the next couple days as the kid went home and kept trying to put different dinosaurs into the pilot seat. I think we left it at the Tyrannosaurus didn't fit and the Velociraptor fit, but it didn't want to stand up. So it might still be a work in progress. Um, the kids are all in for the small details. There is grace in the details. I'm so grateful that the ministry that God calls us to does not have to happen miraculously overnight. It is something we get to build on day after day. If we miss a day or struggle, that's okay. Tomorrow is right around the corner. The grace God wants us to extend to others is also extended to us. This week, I hope that you will find your own way to remind yourself that you are a child of God. I'm also, I'd also like to encourage you to contemplate your own motives for doing things. Why do you do what you do? What is God calling you to? And I'll leave you with that thought and pass it over to David for his conversation. Yeah. I know you just felt comfortable. We're moving now. Thank you, Kayla Stella. That was beautiful. I'm going to add some of my thoughts to the scriptural passage this morning. If I can get this to stay put. And um, just start out by saying um, it's good to be here. It's good to share with you. Thank you for receiving me. Oh, thank you. Much better. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, was asked by Pastor Cody to co-share this morning's sermon. And I thought since we have been learning a lot about um, the book of creation and stewardship uh, in the last several weeks that the sermon was, my contribution was going to be about my testimony as a conservation biologist and serving the land and the Nimipu community where I work in Lapway and how the golden rule heals and sustains life on earth and what our ecological role and responsibility is in that as believers. But 
Um, all of that changed uh, this morning when I woke up because I had a dream that inspired me differently. So um, as I understand, I was working with Kilissa on uh, this a little bit earlier, and as I understand, she said that there's probably an opportunity uh, later to um, share my testimony with a presentation talk or something in a different venue. So that could be forthcoming, but today's reflection is gonna be um, on what my dream inspired and uh, focused on our scriptural passage. Um, that giving is more than the gift, uh, moving from obligation to opportunity in our giving. So my question to you is, what did the tax collector have that the Pharisee lacked? Or what did, and then what did the Pharisee lack? What made them different? So the tax collector it says, like, you know, he beat his chest, have mercy on me, God, have mercy. He knew deep down that his base need was for God's grace. And he had humility, right? Which is what the Pharisee lacked. And I'll say that the Pharisee uh, lacked empathy. You know, thank God I'm not like that guy over there. That's the exact opposite, right? And so um, these two things, humility and empathy, are the building blocks of God's kingdom, right? The foundation which we build our spiritual life off of, which God uses to establish his kingdom of love. So each time we pray for the Father's will, not my will be done, but your will be done, we're praying for humility and empathy. You know, expand my sense of belonging and community. Empathy directs us and humility propels us, the fuel to act. And what is the first beatitude that our Lord teaches on the Sermon of the Mount? Do you remember? Blessed are the poor, poor in spirit. That's right. And that's another way of saying blessed are the humble, the humble those who have humility. It's also translated as meek, which isn't a word we use very much in our day and age, but meek meaning humble. And so um, we can also think of the story of the Good Samaritan, right? What he showed was humili uh, hum humility to show empathy and compassion. And then everybody who passed by the, the thief or the man that was in the ditch um, lacked empathy <laughs> in a big way. So um, humility comes in two ways, at least from my experience. Humility comes um, through humiliation. No humility without humiliation. And just think about the tax collector. What is his job? You know, he's a tax collector. And if he's a man of God or a, a seeker of God's heart, and he realizes that he's in a position that was handed to him maybe by the Roman government to exploit other people, how much humiliation does he have to wrestle with, like all the time? Maybe even people have targeted him because they know that he's the one. You know, tax collectors were not looked upon very nicely in those days, in these days too, perhaps. So he's, he's experiencing humiliation. And... Humility, humility also comes to us in another way, and that is um, identifying with those who are experiencing humiliation, <laughs> empathy. So one way is direct in its relationship to vulnerability, and one way is indirect in its relationship to vulnerability. But vulnerability is the common denominator. How many of you have heard of um, Brene Brown, or Brini, Brene Brown? Yeah. Have you heard, read her stuff or watched her stuff on YouTube or, or Netflix? She's so inspirational. Um, she wrote this book called The Gifts of Imperfection. I highly recommend it uh, because she explores these things that we're talking about right now. Um, and she puts it this way. Vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up 
and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. It's not weakness, contrary to what the world teaches about vulnerability, but our greatest measure of courage as humans. Vulnerability takes courage, right? The Good Samaritan, he had courage. So at the heart of it is being willing to be vulnerable. And in verse 14, at the end of the passage today, it says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Ego in charge, exalt ourselves, right? And those who humble themselves will be exalted. What does that even mean? That's a good question. Like, how does God exalt us? Have you ever thought about that? That's a very, you know, well-known verse. Well, uh, maybe you've experienced some of it in your life as grace. Um, But if we don't get a firm grip on what that might mean, then we're right there with the disciples who are arguing about who's going to be top rank in the kingdom of God, sitting at God the Father's right hand. Remember when Jesus rebukes them for that because they got it wrong? That's not how God exalts us. (laughs) Who's first in God's kingdom? No, it's, well, I mean, if God is love, then God is relationship, then maybe it's about experiencing intimacy, connection, connection with ourselves, with others, with God and creation in a deep, meaningful, rooted way. I wonder And so, when we don't have intimacy, you know, to feel safe, that intimacy is to feel safe, uh, known with others, um, be seen, looked at, be appreciated, be heard, validated, smiled at, touched, loved, and laugh with someone and our friends, to know down deep that someone's got you, that there's someone in your corner, intimacy. When we don't have that, what do we experience when we don't have that kind of connection? Well, I experience the emptiness of disconnect, disconnection, and the hollow heart, you know, the God hole in my heart. I think that's what I learned it as in, at youth camp. And so we experience the emptiness of disconnect as the wounds of abandonment, lack of connection, Right? So that's why we get to hear our Lord's last words in, to, to the disciples in, in the end of Matthew, the last verse in the gospel, is his words saying, do you remember? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am is with you always. A promise of presence and connection. God with us, Emmanuel. And where, where do we go with the unknowns of life when we grasp for certainty and we don't have it? We don't have uh, uh, exercising our life with faith. Um, when we feel that emptiness of disconnect, we what? We become like Adam and Eve. That's what I think. <laughs> after they missed the mark and did the wrong thing in the garden, and uh, what did they go do? They hid from God, right? They hid because they were afraid and they were ashamed. So we hide. We hide and we, when our ego is in charge, like the Pharisee here in our story, we self-justify. We hide by self-justification. And so, isn't that right? Isn't that just how it works? We align ourselves as the Pharisee and cut ourselves off from communion with God when we hide, when we're not vulnerable, when we operate out of uh, ego's toolkit. And that's because we've cut off access to empathy in our heart and connection with ourselves, with compassion toward ourselves and others. So what do we do with that? Well, In closing, um, I want to just offer two examples. 
Who, who is the icon of humility in the Old Testament? When you think about someone who went through humiliation, who pops out in the Old Testament, the oldest book in the Old Testament? Job, St. Job. He is the icon of humility. And it's an extreme story to make a point, right? He's a very wealthy man, but he goes through a lot of loss. He's sitting there in a pile of ashes, scratching himself with a shard of a pot, a, a pot shard because he's got boils. And, he's, and yet he says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? Humility. And so who is the icon of humility besides our Lord in the New Testament? Who do you think? He's also known as the forerunner, the one who made a way for the Lord, to prepare a way for the Lord. St. John the Baptist, that's right. He is definitely an icon of humility because he adopted the ascetic life in a desert, right? And only lived on what God provided him. And what does he say? What's his little message to us? Repent, right? For the kingdom of heaven is near. It's at hand. It's here. In other words, adopt humility right now while you have a chance. Be humble. Humble your heart. Get vulnerable and open up. You know, you don't have a lot of time in this life. None of us do. And the longer that we wait and collude with our ego to hide, the harder our heart gets. And the harder and more difficult it becomes to, to what? To connect with love. To live with compassion. To show grace. To live with trust. That the universe, the cosmos, is governed by love. So that we can strengthen connection with others, ourselves, and creation. So that our life becomes the gift not the gift we give here in the tangible right now, but that our whole life is a vessel of God's energies creating a new earth, his kingdom moving forward, renewing the face of the earth and all creatures on it. Just like we prayed this morning in the bulletin t together. So anyway, we've been learning a lot about um, creation the rev as a general book of revelation the last several Sundays and how it reveals God's divine character as creator. Over, um, and so I want to ask, how does creation work this way? I want to tie it together right here with humility. As a, how does creation work as a book to teach us by? Well, um, I suggest that the more intimate that we know the land and all of God's creatures, the more we will see all of God's creatures as our teachers. They're to orchestrate the spirit by the spirits moving the synergy of message and meaning to us personally. I've experienced this. I'm, I'm not a you know, field biologist for nothing. I, I experience this and I gravitate towards it. And so each plant and animal I've, become, uh, I've seen and each trickle of water or cloud carries an intimate and personal meaning message to us if we're open and we have the eyes to see it. And so perspective becomes everything. We have a choice to either connect with love or disconnect with fear. When we connect with love, we have a different perspective, and the meaning is different. So I'm going to give you a quick story of what I experienced once that illustrates this, and then we'll close. Um, one time I was fishing uh, at a lake with a friend, and we had uh, a bat came by, and, and it was the middle of the day. And, and it kind of like flew over our heads. We ducked, and then it circled, and it came right back at us. And I literally, literally had to move out of the way. It was like trying to hit me or something. And it was scary to me uh, just because it was very odd to see a you know, nocturnal animal in the middle of the day. So it was making another circle. I quickly took off my shirt, and I threw it over it while it was flying, and I caught it up. And uh, we looked at it, my friend and I, and it, we noticed it had kind of bare patches of fur, and it just looked funky, you know? Like, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing's sick. It has rabies. Uh, you know, don't let it bite you. Like, let's go. And I asked my friend, like, do you have any Ziploc bags? We could, you know, put it in a Ziploc and seal it, and then we'll take it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They could run some tests at the lab. We could find out what's going on with this bat colony. You know, it's all messed up. 
Uh, <laughs> and before I could slow down, uh, he just said, well, well, wouldn't that mean that we would have to kill it? You know, seal it in a Ziploc? It's like, I don't really want to kill it. I was like, yeah, but it's diseased, obviously. You know, look at it. And we went around and around. But what slowly began to percolate into my heart was that, you know, that, that Old Testament saying, like, choose you life this day. You have life and death in your hands, you know, therefore choose life. And he's like, well, I don't really want to kill it. Why don't we just, um, you know, see what, uh, what, what we can find on Google? And what we found was baby bats will sometimes get disoriented and come out of their roost in the middle of the day. Maybe they're, they're feeling hungry. And they don't grow, they don't always grow their fur uh, consistently across their whole body when they're growing. And sometimes it has patches. I was just thinking like chemotherapy, like this thing's sick. And um, so we found out information and he's like, let's, let's just put it back on a tree underneath a piece of bark here and he'll be fine. And it just converted my whole, the whole meaning of the experience. Because he was choosing life, and I was making a choice out of fear, you know? And so um, that just illustrates the, uh, maybe the difference here between the Pharisee and the tax collector, choosing a, a love in a humble way. Um, at the, uh, this morning, I mentioned that I woke up with a dream that changed things for me in giving you this sermon. And when I woke, when I was dreaming, I was thinking, like, what on earth am I going to say? Like, I just, I can share, you know, how I got to the job I'm doing and what I do. But uh, then I just heard this voice, like, oh, just bring a rattle with you. Do you have a rattle? I was like, no, I don't have a rattle. <laughs> and uh, then the, the voice was like, yeah, but rattlesnakes have rattles. You know, they rattle, right? I was like, yeah, and, and so go get a rattle from the nursery, the kids, like, playroom, and a, and a rattlesnake rattle. And then you can have those as props. <laughs> and I'm trying to go, I'm like, what? And um, what I reflected on after I woke up was, oh, well, God speaks to us differently with di from a different perspective. If we hear a rattlesnake rattle outside, we're going to have a very different response than if we hear a rattle indoors at a, in a kid's nursery. As a, as a, one is a communication of celebration. One is a communication of a warning, right, a danger. But they're both rattles. So it occurred to me, I was like, oh, I don't have a rattles, but I do have feathers. And, and here's my prop. You know, this is the biggest feather. And that sometimes God speaks to us in a loud, big, booming way. Like through the rain uh, storm, the whirlwind, or the, the flood, the fire. And in other ways, like in, when he talked to Elijah, he said, I'm not in the thunder and lightning. I'm in that still, small voice where I speak to you in your heart. And that's like the lightest of feathers, an owl feather. But both are relevant, and both uh, need discernment, discernment in our heart for how God is speaking to us. So I wanted to sh um, close with that um, and say... Uh, the repeat the wonderful words that we had in our in our prayer together this morning praise the god of small seeds and mighty power he works in both small ordinary ways and great mighty powerful ways and together they are linked and together they fulfill and bring about god's kingdom amen amen let's pray Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this word of Scripture to us to help us to choose humility and empathy. Thank you that those are the first rungs on the spiritual ladder that you ask us to hike, to climb, to make progress while we're here on earth and to learn your wisdom, the secret wisdom of the heart. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see your ways and follow them. Thank you that you have given us a time on a holy day like today to gather together and to celebrate your gift to us and your communion. And I pray this prayer, this liturgical prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the, heart it, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle them with the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And you will renew the face of the earth. 
and you do it daily. O God, who, is by, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructed the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations and comfort. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. couple logistics before Liz Chavez comes up um, and shares with you. Um, if you're joining us online, we will have the kind of instructions going on the screen, but we won't have anyone giving you instructions because Liz is going to talk to us about another matter. And then uh, if you guys are in here, it looks like plates are going to be coming around. So um, thanks. Thanks, Patty and David, for <laughs> getting us a little taller stand here. Stewardship. As Pastor Cody was outlining his calendar and the church calendar for the upcoming months at our monthly church council meeting, there became a spontaneous conversation about how the topic of stewardship has been addressed, celebrated, discussed in the past. Some ways of discussing the sometimes awkward topic of money and the church were pledge cards with follow-up phone calls or home visits, passing around a mock saddlebag that reminded us of our Wesleyan history, history as a traveling ministry, small group discussions about stewardship with a pledge drive to follow. There were lots of ways for preparing to create a budget for the coming year with an eye to future goals and needs of our church. So when Cody suggested that we have a series on stewardship moments, I volunteered because I felt I had something to share with you and it reminds me of my own spiritual history and faith journey. My parents moved our family to Lewiston in 1960. My three sisters and I were absolutely convinced that they had ruined our lives. L luckily, they did not, and they did know better than I did, which was pretty cool because I was only in the eighth grade. And once we were moved in, they enrolled us in school, and then we looked for a church. The church on Normal Hill was so magnificent that, to tell you the truth, we were pretty intimidated. But there was a robust Sunday school, MYF, Methodist Youth Fellowship, Women's Society, which became UMW, United Methodist Women, which is now Women of Faith, choir and church council. It became our church, and my dad was asked to serve on the church council itself. His concern about the upkeep of the church weren't so very different all these years later, and those early discussions around our table have been helpful as I grew up and now I serve in the church. My parents' faith was very different as well, about as different as each other could be. My dad just simply believed without seeing. My mom questioned everything while supporting the church and its missions. My dad was a big equipment operator, mostly huge cranes on construction projects. And my mom, after serving as our church secretary for a couple of years, went to work in the registrar's office at LC. As some of you know, working in the trades and construction being one of those can be a case of feast or famine. But my parents, well, my mom, had worked out a system of how to manage when we were experiencing either of those economic scenarios. During a time of feasting, my mom set aside funds that could meet expenses with an envelope system so that we weren't evicted <laughs> we could buy groceries and meet other bills. The Saturday after the last day of the school year, we all went to the nearest town with a department store and picked out our new school clothes from the inside out, and mom put them on layaway. At the end of August, we went back to the store and we all went home with new school clothes. Likewise, in paying the bills each month, mom had a system for that too 
And that's where the stewardship moment of this comes into play because she always wrote the first check or full, filled the first envelope with what the family was tithing to our church. As a math lesson, when I was in Mr. Gilmore's sixth grade class in Hagerman Elementary, we were to sit down with our parents or whoever it was that paid the bills in our family and find out about income and expenses. You might imagine my surprise when mom explained that when dad wasn't working, we didn't have an income, but we still had expenses. Yikes! But I learned that mom's system, you can make money work for you, pay your obligations, and still have a vision for family vacations, higher education, music lessons, and other family goals. But in sitting next to my mom during this lesson, I learned something even more important than this life skill. I learned how smart my mom was, how my sisters and I often undervalued her, but why our dad loved and valued her so highly, and why her first check was written to the church. This is what my mom said when I asked her why that was the first check that she wrote. You know that I question almost everything in the Bible, the discipline of the Methodist Church, and other sacred writings. What I don't question is a God who made your dad and you girls and our family as a whole. That's a God of love and support. So if I do my part in supporting the church and the work of the church, then I can fully trust God to take care of the really big problems. So today, every month, really old school, at the beginning of every month, I sit down and I write out checks to fulfill my obligations. And the first check that I write is to the church. Before we go on to this song, while they're getting ready, um, for those of us who do not have the benefit of being in this church since it was on Normal Hill, um, what building? What is the building used for now? Oh, uh, it, right now it's vacant, um, but it is we're in the process. I'm part of a task force that is working to save it, and we have um, we have some other people that have joined us recently. So we're going to save the building. The Civic Theater, right? Okay, that's um, just double checking my own remembrance as well, um, but that is where this church was before our building here. So and our closing song is Blessed Assurance in the United Methodist Hymnal 369. <laughs>
right, so we have some announcements. Um, an Advent book study will be coming soon, so keep you posted. Um, is that our only? Yep, that's our only announcement. Cool. Uh, oh, wait, we have some over here. I'd like to say that we're going to cancel adult Sunday school next Sunday, but anybody is welcome to come. Each session, we're discussing a different question. We're doing uh, serious answers to hard questions, and uh, you won't have missed anything if you haven't been. So we'd love to have you come, but the Sunday after this one at 10 o'clock. Just want to remind everybody, don't forget men's coffee at 9.30 on Wednesday. 9.30 on Wednesday, okay. And, oh. Kyle's going to be the speaker on Wednesday. I see it here in the bulletin. That sounds exciting. Um, let's see. So Adult Sunday School will be skipping next week, but feel free to join the next week. Um, Patty? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Since we're talking Lewis and Civic Theater. Two more weekends. Two more weekends? Okay. So, you're right, I brought it up. Uh, Lewis and Civic Theater uh, is having the Little Shop of Horrors um, opening today. Open on, open on Friday. I am really behind. Last Friday. And Kyle's running the soundboard for it. So, it's going for two more weeks. Uh, so, I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, all right. Anything else? Any other hands? I will, um, I'm making this announcement with the full disclosure that I have no ideas, but it's Pastor Appreciation Month. And since Cody's not here, it seems like a great time for us to chit chat behind his back. So, feel free to come up with any ideas. <laughs> and he might be watching, that's why I'm not giving ideas. So, yeah, Cody, just ignore it, just ignore us. Just ignore us. Um, all right, anyway. Um, also, I don't have any ideas. But if you guys have any ideas, I'd be happy to help. Even just like a kind note would probably go a long way. Um, since that's something he can't really announce, I'm announcing it. And then we're going to go into our benediction before our postlude. So if you'd please join me in attitude of prayer, whatever that looks like for you. Dear Lord God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for our community and family. Please watch over us as we move through this week and through this world to show little small pieces of grace to those around us. And please help us also be willing to accept your seeds of grace for ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.